welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. To my knowledge, this is the only channel dedicated to steampunk fiction. That wonderful genre that combines science fiction with history. And I also sometimes uh, review works of nonfiction history, which is what I'm going to do today. Today I'm talking about the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. And he was a noted British historian of the 18th century. In fact, his first volume of this six-volume set was published in 1776. So it's been around for a while. And he studied at Oxford. He studied at Lausanne, Switzerland. And he was in, influenced by rationalist theology and uh, luminaries such as John Locke and Blaise Pascal. Yeah, the mathematician they named the computer language after. <clears throat> now... He was, Gibbon was uh, an interesting character with, with a long history of uh, flirtation with different ideas and so on. He was raised in the Anglican Church, became a Catholic for a while, went back to being an Anglican uh, because his father was very distressed <laughs> by his conversion. But in any case, he was of, often accused of being a, too much of a skeptic or a rationalist uh, by uh, various Christian uh, type writers. Anyway, this is a long, this is a big work, and I got my copy as a free ebook from Gutenberg.org, and I've sung the praises of this on previous occasions. It shows up as, on my phone, as 9,000 screens, which is probably like, I don't know, 5,000 pages or so on paper, and so it's a long work, but technology makes it easier to get through. And uh, I have read the first four volumes, and I'm well into the fifth as of the time of this of this uh, video. But I think that the most significant part of the first three, and that's the part that deal with the Western Roman Empire mostly, which is the part that we Americans, those of us who know anything about history at all, know a little bit better. A little bit of background for those of you who may not be quite so familiar. Rome began as a village around 750 BC on the banks of the Tiber River in what we now call Italy. And it was founded by the legendary brothers Romulus and Remus, and uh, Rome takes its name from Romulus. And uh, it started, you know, as a small kingdom, became a republic in the, the, in the tradition of the ancient Greeks, and then turned into an empire spanning most of the known world. At its peak, eight centuries later, Rome ruled all of Europe, well, all of Europe west of the Rhine and south of the Danube anyway, so that's at least half, at least half of the continent, uh, most of Britain, all of Africa north of the Sahara, all of the Middle East, uh, excluding the desert wastes of Arabia. And so <clears throat> it was a pretty big empire. Even, even by today's standards, it would be a, it's a big area. Uh, to rule. Now in those days, of course, there was no modern communication. People had to go on horseback was the fastest way, or, or by ship. So it was definitely a different time. In around 330 AD, uh, the, the great Constantine I, he was the first Christian era, era emperor. He was the first Christian emperor of Rome. He relocated the capital to Constantinople, uh, which is uh, on the straits between called the Bosphorus between Europe and Asia. And there's a famous song about that. It's from the 50s. <laughs> Istanbul, not Constantinople. And, and so you've, I'm sure you've heard it. And uh, yeah, it's that, it's that place. And uh, that ended up, the empire ended up, ended up splitting up. And uh, the Western Empire didn't last a lot longer. Uh, in 476, it fell, Rome fell to the barbarians. But Constantinople went on for a lot longer time, uh, for another thousand years. So it's very, very significant to our history. Uh, as Americans, as you know, part of the Western uh, civilization, it is definitely important for people to know, and it's something they don't teach very much in schools these days. Even in my day, which was eons ago, they didn't teach all that much of it. As I said, uh, Decline and Fall is a six-volume set, and set, and it does not begin with the founding of Rome. Instead, it begins with Antonine emperors, and these seven guys who ruled Rome from uh, AD 96 through 192, 
And that was pretty much the, the whole second century. And thus he skips the more salacious reigns of, peop of the empire's people, emperor's people know, like Tiberius, Nero, Caligula, all those uh, very corrupt and crazy guys. And uh, no, it skips those. We know them because of their association with the time of Jesus and so on, around that time. Uh, no, the first five of the Antonine dynasty, starting on Neva to Marcus Aurelius, are known as the five good emperors. And uh, I guess that's not a very high bar <laughs> for, for Rome. But anyway, uh, the decline of Rome starts, according to Gibbon, with the reign of Lucius Verus and his successor Commodus, who was especially brutal and uh, tyrannical. And Commodus' first name, and, and he does go into some detail as, as to the crimes and, and, uh, and so on in the repression of Commodus. His full name was Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus Augustus Herculius Romanus Ex Exuberatorius Amazonius Invictus Felix Pius. And that mouthful. <laughs> anyway, and, and at the end he was assassinated, of course, which was a pretty common way for Roman emperors to end. As far as I know, they did not name the commode after him, but it's it's based based on a Latin word that means convenience. So I don't know I don't know why you would name somebody that, but they did. Now the version of this book that I have uh, was an 1845 edition with uh, it's been, it was edited by with copious notes by the Reverend Henry Hart Millman, uh, who was lived from 1791 to 1868. He was also a historian and a noted playwright, though, to my knowledge, I don't know if we celebrate or stage any of these plays today. So, Gibbon started with three volumes, which uh, went from, as I said, the good emperors, to the fall of Rome to the barbarians in the year 476. But, at the point, he writes, he writes almost kind of a, at the end of the third volume, he's got kind of a um, summary and kind of a, an epilogue, but he decided, later on he decided he was not done, and he had to write about the Eastern Empire, Empire which carried on the Roman tradition, so that next thousand years is the subject of three more volumes, until the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. And the, through the last three volumes, at least as far as the fourth and the fifth, as far as I've gotten through, they don't deal just with the East. They also talk about what happened to the remnants of the Roman Empire, you know, in what we now call France, Italy, North Africa, uh, Britain, and so on, Germany. And, you know, the barbarians, how they took over, they became you new know, rulers of Rome, etc. The first point I'm going to address is, uh, what is Gibbon's writing at? Writing like? Is it, is it any good? Is it interesting? Second is... What about the subject matter? Is it is it interesting? Is it worthwhile? And third, what is what if any is the value of this narration to our present day lives? First of all, uh, Gibbon was considered a master historian in his day and re received many accolades for this work. Now, his text is generally to the point. And it goes into great detail, sometimes more than you'd like. I mean, you learn about, you know, Roman, uh, Roman customs, Roman religion, their politics, the, the practice of law, um, commerce, and all these different things about the neighbors of Rome, including the you know, barbarians uh, to the north and not so much to the south, though they do. He does talk about the Ethiopians, but uh, so the barbarians to the north and the south and uh, some of the kingdoms to the east, like Persia, which Rome considered barbarians, but they weren't really. It was an older civilization than Rome. And so you hear all this, all this stuff, this immense detail, which um, leaves a little bit, makes it a little bit confusing, because he has to jump back and forth. For example, in the, the, the section about law, he goes all the way back to the beginning and talks about Roman law, the history of Roman law, and, and brings it back up to, you know, at least to the fall of Rome. So that is a little bit of a, a little bit of a point of frustration. Second thing is that uh, the language words have kind of changed their meaning a bit. So you have to be cognizant of that. 
One thing I found amusing is he refers in, at several points to naked barbarian warriors. <laughs> and I don't think they probably actually fought without clothing. I imagine that probably means they didn't have armor on like the Romans did. Uh, also, play, it's places have changed names. And so, you know, what we now call France was called Gaul. And uh, Bulgaria was Dacia. <laughs> Uh, Tunisia was called Africa. And it wasn't the whole continent, just Tunisia. And uh, Turkey was called Asia. Again, that's why we call it Asia Minor now. Also, he refers to the Black Sea as the Yushin, which is a kind of an alternate term that's fallen out of favor. Yushin means hospitable sea, which it isn't. It's very stormy, so it's kind of a name like uh, Greenland, one of, those, one of those ironic names, I guess. Uh, finally, one more point of confusion is that people, I mean, despite all those appellations and so on that some of the emperors brought on, on themselves, they didn't really have surnames, so to speak. And so, generally he'll refer to these people at, by one name, you know, like, like Maximus. There's a lot of guys named Maximus, and Maximinimus, and Maximumus, and so on. And all these guys, uh, they're a little bit hard to keep, to keep separated. But, but for you Monty Python fans, there is no Naudius Maximus. Sorry, sorry, there just wasn't one in here. Sometimes Gibbon will talk about a later person, like, for example, Constantine, because there was a zillion guys named Constantine after the emperor and so on, and he'll refer something that the Constantine the first did, and then, but there's another Constantine is already on the throne at this point in the narration, so it can be a little bit confusing. Luckily, Reverend Millman helps out a lot in his notes. He will say, well, he's referring to this guy, and so on. So, the notes are worth checking out, although sometimes they're a little tedious, like that refers, you know, footnotes, like the page and so on, of what, what ancient history that, that was their primary source. But it's very, very well sourced. It's not something, you know, you do, you do, you do find out where, where Gibbon got all this stuff from. And so... So yeah, the footnotes can be a little bit, a little bit frustrating because they're in the middle of the text, and not just at the end of the chapters, but they are helpful to refer to at times. And worst of all is all the Latin. <laughs> there is a ton of Latin because it's Rome, you know, and you know modern, you know, British scholars at the time, a lot of them spoke Latin. Probably most of them we don't, <laughs> and so it's just it's just kind of a, something to skip over really quickly. Uh, with that out of the way back to the good points, it is a really exhaustive, exhaustive history, and there's a ton of stuff, and it, he hardly leaves anything out. So anything you want to know, it's in there. And as a history buff, I find this stuff fascinating. Also, as I said before, Millman, the editor, he brings in a lot of stuff to help clear up the confusion, any kind of, uh, any kind of ambiguous references that Gibbon makes, Millman helps clear those up. And it's funny, too, sometimes he disputes, sometimes he, like, scolds Gibbon, who I believe was passed away at this time, but sometimes he, he disagrees vehemently with, with what Gibbon's, Gibbon said, particularly about Christianity, because Gibbon was kind of snarky about organized religion, whereas his Millen was a reverend. And so he said, well, it's kind of anti-Christian that Gibbon minimizes the persecution of Christians by Rome. But, in fact, I think that it wasn't as bad, at least not consistent. It was not consistent, like a lot of people think, from, from what little they know about Roman history. And so, if you were to get this in audiobook, I've heard it's over 60 hours. But, again, I, I kind of like to have the, the initial source, and you can't beat the cost of free from Gutenberg.org. And so... Roman, Roman history, I mean, it's, it's very cool, it's very fascinating, it's very violent <laughs> and exciting. And, and it, doubtless it's proved the inspiration for many, many uh, classic, writers of classic works, such as Dune. I mean, I know Herbert supposedly took some of his, his history from, you know, the Muslim wars against Russia and other places like that. But obviously a lot of it has echoes of what happened with Roman emperors. And, like, for example, there was, if you think of Bar Baron Harkonnen, I mean, there was, 
there were emperors that were literally like him, up to and including the the horrible skin problems. <laughs> uh, Game of Thrones, too. A lot of this stuff, uh, the very decadent and brutal, brutal behavior in Game of Thrones was apparently based on, well, medieval history, but also Roman history, I think. Now, there was a lot of really fascinating stuff in this, in this series. And so far, I mean, I can just give a, a very few examples of these because there's so much. First of all, the term Caesar and Augustus. Yes, there was a Caesar Augustus, but after uh, Julius and, and his successor Augustus, Caesar, these terms became titles. Uh, they weren't just names. And so, and they would sometimes have a Caesar. And you think of the Caesar as being, a, being a, an emperor, kind of like the Tsar. The, Roman, the Russians had Tsars. But they weren't just the the, sometimes they'd have an emperor, and then they'd have a separate guy who was a Caesar, and a separate guy who was an Augustus. So in a way, they, they distinguished people who were near the top of the hierarchy. Usually, uh, Roman, you know, usually Caesar was supposed to be synonymous with emperor, but it wasn't always. And sometimes it was a way to divide power, which was kind of weird, because it's tough. I mean, I know Americans, we believe in division of powers, but the problem with in Romans, the Romans, they didn't delineate this. They didn't say, you're in charge of this and you're in charge of that so much. They had like co-emperors, which even if it was like father and son or two brothers, which it often was, it didn't work out very well. <laughs> Human beings being what they are. Now, one thing that was disappointing, and I suppose a lot of people will find it disappointing, was that Romans were not as decadent and, uh, you know, and as, as scandalous and sinful as a lot of moderns think. Even as pagans, they could be real prudes. For example, you know, there were laws against a lot of the kind of behavior we think of when we think of Caligula and so on. Uh, and there they had, for example, there was a law in ancient Rome that said if you eloped with some guy's daughter, some guy's virgin daughter, without his permission, you could be executed. <laughs> <laughs> and this was if you married her. It didn't matter if you married her. You know, it was still like, you know, you took his daughter. And so they could be very priggish. And, and, and at times, the age of adulthood was like 25. We're still, you were, you were expected to be, obey your, obey your father till, to, uh, through entire, his entire life. Which probably contributed to a lot of, um, a lot of assassinations of fathers, unfortunately. Uh, the, those that weren't very reasonable, you know. Though slavery was common until, until in the later empire, the Christians eventually started abolishing it. But early on, sometimes people would thought it was a little bit better to be a slave uh, than a Roman uh, aristocrat, because if you're an aristocrat, your father uh, ruled you your entire life, whereas a slave, you might you might eventually buy your buy your own freedoms. One one area in which Rome truly was decadent compared to us was gladiatorial games, which they persisted into the Christian Empire, and it wasn't just punishing people like throwing Christians to lions. They just enjoyed seeing people hacking each other to death in the arena, and uh, you know Christianity kind of softened this stuff, but even so, they would sometimes, you know, punish heretics and so on in the arena, uh, or people who refused to convert when, you know, pagans who were stubborn and refused to convert. And they, off, they also had, and this was the most popular thing in Rome, was chariot races were so very popular, and yet they were pretty dangerous. A lot of people got killed, killed during these, these very popular races. Here's an interesting factoid that, that kind of goes into uh, the obsessions of the age with racism and so on, uh, of our age, that is. Anti-Semitism, and, and that is in, in the idea of prejudice against Jews, predates Christianity. No, Christians did not invent this. Uh, the Roman province of Judea was one of the most troublesome provinces, which probably gave rise to a lot of this anti-Jewish sentiments. This was because 
uh, Jews, unlike most of the people that the Romans conquered, most of the people were very tolerant of the Roman, Roman religion. I mean, they were pagans too, and the Romans would just say, okay, we'll take your gods too, and we'll have all of our gods, and we'll just worship all of our gods, and we'll all be happy. <laughs> Whereas the Jews said, no, <laughs> you cannot worship any other god but the one god. So they were very stubborn, and the Romans didn't like this at all. And even, even eventually they relented and said, okay, you Jews don't have to worship our emperor. That's okay. We'll give you an exemption. Even so, they still insisted on putting up temp temples to Jupiter and so on in Jerusalem, which did not go over well at all. And, and a lot of Jews would, would uh, cooperate with Roman authorities and essentially become culturally Roman. Those guys often got killed. <laughs> Very reminiscent of what you know has happened to some of the people in Muslim countries uh, cooperating with the Americans or the Russians and whatever you know whatever situation. Being emperor was an extremely dangerous job. <laughs> I mean, you might think, oh yeah, you get all the you know all these concubines and all this wealth and all this stuff, but no, you had to watch your back all the time, including from your own family. That's most of them ended their days by assassination. You know, if an emperor would die without heirs or successors, they would try and find some notable person, maybe a judge or a religious leader or whatever, and they'd say, okay, we want you to be emperor. And he said, no, 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 give it to somebody else. I don't deserve it. Please, please. I am totally unworthy. <laughs> and, and obviously, that's because, you know, he would rather not go around with the target on his back. And so, from time to time, in this in this history, there were outstanding individuals, sometimes outstandingly cruel and vicious and greedy, sometimes outstandingly noble and just. And so it's very interesting to follow the careers of some of these men, mostly men, occasionally women, of these of these interesting and noble emperors. My favorite was a guy called Julian the Apostate. He was the last pagan ruler of Rome. And he decreed religious toleration. He said, everybody's equal. We, it's okay to be pagan, it's okay to be Christian, it's okay to be any kind of Christian you want. The Christians hated this. They hated him. Why? Well, partially because he was, he was uh, raised as a Christian and changed his mind, which, you know, most a lot of religions can't tolerate that kind of apostasy. Hence his name. And also because... Christians were very intolerant of each other. There were a lot of different sects, different philosophies, and they wanted to oppress each other. And, and Julian said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. You have to be, you have to be peaceful and tolerant. And uh, one of the most interesting things he did was he said, remember when you Christians formed mobs and sacked these pagan temples and turned them into churches? You know what? That was illegal. You have to put them back to pagan temples and you have to pay for it out of your own pockets because that was, you know, that was not right. And so a lot of the early churches were bankrupted by Julian's decree, which in my view was 100% just. And so, so he was, you know, he wasn't perfect. He sometimes, sometimes was, was uh, oppressive, but for the most part, he was a very good guy, and unfortunately, like a lot of Roman, Romans, he, he died young, although it was, I believe in his case, it was because he insisted on go, leading his troops into battle. <laughs> and that's how he got killed. Here's another interesting thing about Rome and the fall of Rome. A lot of people will say, okay, Rome fell because they were, they were wicked and they were um, into all this sexual immorality and stuff. Not true. <laughs> Not true at all. When Rome fell, at least when the, well, actually, it, deals with both sides, but particularly when the Western Roman Empire fell, it was a, it was a Christian country, and it was illegal to be a pagan. <laughs> the, uh, it was the law of the land, and, and they were not tolerant of homosexuals. They were not, you know, they did not have emperors having affairs with their sisters as Caligula was said to have done. <laughs> uh, and yet, even so, even so, they fell the barbarians. So it was, at least in this case, this is a myth that was absolutely not true. Uh, but on the other hand, and I think this did lead to the Roman decline, early Christians were extremely intolerant of each other's differences in beliefs. 
They would fight battles. They would persecute each other. They would execute people. Uh, and because of small differences of belief, for example, the Holy Trinity. Uh, those of you who are Christians know that uh, there are three persons. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and you think, oh, well, that's simple. No, it's not simple. Some said, well, these three are just three aspects of the same being. Others said, no, they're separate beings. They're very close, but, they're, but they are separate. And so, and I believe like the LDS Church has that second view, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And in, this, in these days, it was, a, it was a difference worth killing over. <laughs> they absolutely could not tolerate this very small difference in theology. Which is very strange. It doesn't seem like it would have much of a bearing on living a good life and uh, you know, and faith and charity and I mean, faith being you know, just believing through times of adversity, etc. Also, interestingly enough, by the time by the time the bar bar barbarians were invading Rome, most of them were Christian too, <laughs> and they had been Christianized by uh, by the ministries the missionaries that Rome was constantly sending out, which was lucky for them because, because they were Christians, they were, they were less brutal than they probably would have been otherwise as pagans. They, uh, they would usually let uh, women and children live, although they often took them as slaves. <laughs> and, you know, they'd just kill the military-aged males. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, that was, that was interesting, and, and that was one of my favorite parts, was talking about the barbarians, because those were my ancestors. You know, the Alemanni, the Gulf, the Goths, the Vandals, <laughs> those guys. Uh, anyway, they they were very they were very interesting. All of them. I mean, different lifestyles and so on, different cultures, and how the cultures blended together as the barbarians moved in. Uh, finally, the fall of Roman was not a sudden thing. Uh, it was a long, sad stumble from majesty to devastation. And there were a lot of times when it looked like Rome was about to fall, and then some great leader would come and say, No, I'm going to save Rome. I'm going to drain the swamp. And, you know, unlike our recent president, they actually did it. <laughs> they actually succeeded in draining the, draining the swamp, for a while, at least. Uh, but eventually, you know, the corruption was just too much, too much to get rid of, and Rome was no more. So I'd like to close with the... Uh, the fun and interesting idea of finding parallels between the fall of Rome, at least in, I'm going to say the Western Empire, because it was a more of a, a better known thing. So this is a common pastime. It's been a pastime of uh, political theorists as long as I can remember. And so I'm going to do it myself. How, in what ways are there parallels? I mean, after all, the American Empire does seem to be in a little bit of trouble right now. An empire is kind of a good metaphorical name, even though we don't have an emperor. First of all, we have a lot of internal dissent, a lot of acrimony, a lot of people really hate each other. We have economic troubles, we have foreign challenges right now in Ukraine, and we have a lot of cultural changes, all this non-binary stuff and so on, and, and you know, anti-whiteness, <laughs> all this crazy stuff going on. As I noted, Decadence did not kill the Roman Empire, at least not sexual decadence. However, I see it as a lack of energy, a lack of spirit, a lack of vitality. Uh, and uh, the Romans didn't have that fighting spirit anymore. They didn't, they, their population declined. They didn't, they didn't uh, start commerce and so on. They, they didn't a lot of, you know, these nobles were just kind of content to rest on their proverbial laurels. People didn't want to be in the military, so they brought in barbarians <laughs> to be a Rome's army, which was not that good of an idea. And they would, instead of fighting their enemies, they would pay them off from their own treasury, which tended to bankrupt the country, and the barbarians weren't very trustworthy as far as you know, keeping their word, okay, we won't invade you. Well, we've changed our mind. We want more tribute. Sorry. And so, because of that, they had a lot of people coming in, a lot of immigration, people who weren't into the Roman culture. They didn't have a connection. They didn't understand it. And here's a thing that's a little weird that I may, 
I may or may not get roasted for non-binary <laughs> uh, non-binary tendencies the practice of rendering boys into eunuchs uh, rather distasteful but it definitely was non-binary right <laughs> and the Romans didn't do it originally but the Persians imported it I mean the Persians had it and a lot of the Eastern Romans you know that the, the emperors over there they started started to be done in Rome and uh, these eunuchs because they were close to power they sometimes became very powerful uh, just like Varus uh, the ball guy in Game of Thrones and they were often seen as being very treacherous and you know I don't blame them because that that was not their choice uh, to be raised as eunuchs but it's interesting that, Ga that, that Gibbon refers to them in his text as a third sex, hence non-binary. In one last parallel, the Romans were really obsessed with their entertainment, uh, in particular sports. And they were so obsessed with sports that they would form kind of these almost cultish societies in which, uh, just, just as, a, as an example, the chariot racers were organized into teams that were distinguished by colors and the most successful teams were the greens and the blues and so the the fans of the greens and the blues would often get into these riots and they would sometimes kill each other <laughs> as a result of these riots and they would have you know there some of them in politics they would uh, get into office they would they would discriminate against the enemy greens or the, en or the enemy blues and bring their own blues or greens into power. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that it was so they were so they were such super fans. In other words, that they were really really uh, obsessed with that, even while the empire was crumbling around them. In any case, it was very very interesting, and I think that these things. I mean, it may or may not be so bad as, as we think right now, but in any case, uh, it should give us pause. It should give us a little food for thought. So, for now, this has been the Steampunk Desperado, and my review of at least the first four volumes of Edward Gibbon's History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And I would give it 4.5 out of 5 gears because it's such a wonderful work with so much detail even though it's a little bit confusing at times please let me know what you think in the comments below I will um, you know whether or not you like the idea of talking about history rather than fiction on occasion I'm not going to do this all the time but thanks for bearing with me and uh, please like and subscribe the more viewers we get the more we can continue our mission of of uh, promoting steampunk, that wonderful genre, and history, that neglected mode of scholarship these days. This is the Steampunk Desperado saying, adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.